let's move on. Let's bring in our experts. We have Nelson D'Souza, General Manager, FundSupermart.com. We also have Jayan Pai, uh, VP and CFP at Parag Pare Financial Services. Gentlemen, great having you with us. You know, before I start off a discussion on mutual funds and insurance policies, just want to get your perspective on the ramifications for the normal customers out there, the depositors out there from the savings bank deregulation. Nelson, I mean, what's been your sense? I'm, I'm sure you must have been flooded with queries from customers asking about whether it makes sense to get into a Yes Bank right now. Maybe investors should take their money out from a State Bank of India, start parking it in Yes Bank, especially because it's offering 6% on savings bank. I mean, what's your sense? You see this inflow happening. I mean, um, it's it's good for the it's good for the investors. It's uh, clearly good for investors uh, who want to look at savings as an investment option, savings banks as an investment option. I think uh, over a period of time, you'll see more and more money moving back into savings account. Uh, savings account is a better opportunity uh, for investors who want uh, to invest into banks because it gives you the flexibility which fixed deposits do not give you. Uh, yes, like you said, we've had a lot of queries coming in lately. Investors asking us, does it make sense to uh, now move money from uh, some in from mutual fund investments, from uh, fixed deposits which are short term, uh, to savings bank accounts? Um, we have been telling them we have to still get a view on it. But uh, personally speaking, I think it's uh, good for, uh, for, a, for a bank uh, customer to move money into a savings bank account at the moment if he's not had it there because 6% is a, a fairly decent rate of return. Uh, if you look at the real rate of return, yes, it is uh, still going to have you in the negative, but uh, for short-term funds, for funds which require flexibility, savings bank uh, rates uh, at the moment are uh, quite attractive. Hmm, and that's the point that I want to raise here. Jent, you know, that's a very valid interest, uh, valid uh, point. For the last one year, the market's not gone anywhere. So if you're in in invested in a mutual fund which was linked to the equity markets, more or less your returns haven't been anything great to talk about. On top of that, once we see interest rates coming down, and somehow suddenly this whole 6% saving rate is going to look very attractive for all those risk averse customers out there. I mean, do you think this could be a real threat not only to other banks but even to some of the other investment classes? See, Ashu, here we are underestimating the cunning nature of banks because no bank will give you a free lunch. So if there is an outsized increase in the savings rate, there will be 100 other charges and expenses that such uh, customers will have to bear. So we have to look at the at the holistic picture and not get swayed just by the headline rate. So I mean, for people who are contemplating such a move, I mean, they should look at the uh, at the entire picture and then make a move because it's not that easy. It's not like switching between mutual funds online and opening a savings account and closing it and all that. It's a tedious task. And anyway, savings accounts should only be kept only for your contingency needs. So, you know, extremely lethargic people are the only ones who keep outsized amounts in such uh, savings accounts. So, and anyway, I think those people will be too lethargic to move. Okay, so Jan believes it's more a case of lethargy rather than anything else. That's a very interesting point there. You know, I'm just going to talk about NHPC's numbers before I come back on the discussion. NHPC's second quarter numbers have come out. Uh, I'm just going to reflect uh, what's the stock impact. The stock's up. 6% right now as far as trading is concerned. So obviously, there's some good news in the numbers. Uh, second quarter profit at 966 crores. Second quarter sales at NHPC are at 1830 odd crores. The stock immediately spiked up. It's up nearly 6%. NHPC in the past has talked about their plans for expansion and that's something they're looking at. I believe 1800 megawatt of stream capacity comes up over the next 2 to 3 years. They've also talked about uh, ramping up their presence across various other parts of the country but predominantly to hydropower generation and most of these projects are long gestation projects. NHPC has been a very, very sluggish mover ever since the stock got listed and hasn't really done anything. It, I mean, the only uh, good thing about the stock is that it's more like a utility. You tend to get assured returns, but still uh, somehow the investor sentiment is not really reflecting that. The stock's at 24, 5.5% higher on the stock. We could see a spike up, but some of the rallies in these kind of stocks, like an NHPC or an SJVN, uh, tend to die out very, very strongly. I mean, as far as trading is concerned. Let's come back and let's uh, bring in our experts uh, and let's uh, bring in our first caller here. Uh, we have uh, Kiran who's joining us right now from Pune. Kiran, hi. What's your question? Yeah, hi, Ashu. Uh, I'm investing in Kanda Roboco and Hezbollah Suite of 200. Um, yes, go ahead, please. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, I am investing to SIP, uh, 2000 in each fund. Um, it's a 
can I invest in some other, uh, in some other in mutual funds? Uh, okay, fair enough. Jen, first to you. Canada Roboco and HDFC Top 200, the investor wants to move on to some other mutual funds. Which ones would you endorse? See, both these funds are good ones. Except that in Canada, due to this fund management change recently, you'll have to just monitor how this fund is performing. But anyway, like since it is, if it is within the lock-in period, he cannot do anything. Once the lock-in is over, only then he could review it. Now, regarding future investments in this fund, uh, most likely from April 1st, 2012, all ELSS funds will uh, lose the tax benefit. So then it does not make much sense to uh, you know, invest in these funds. So then after that, that is after April 1st, he could uh, think of some other one, say a DSP equity or a Fidelity equity, you know, depending on, see this is a multi-cap or large, large to mid-cap fund. Also he is lacking a pure large cap fund in his portfolio. So in case he is thinking of allocating more money towards mutual funds, then he could choose either an index fund, say like a Franklin India index fund or uh, another pure large cap fund like say ICICI focused blue chip. But see, I mean any equity investment you should do only if you have a long term horizon, otherwise you will get, you know, you will lose your sleep. Now regarding the, uh, regarding HDFC top 200, so far it's performing well, it's becoming a kind of a consensus favorite. So there may be periods when it may underperform, but I guess that he could stay invested in this. Mm -hmm. And Nelson, what's your opinion? If you were to advise any further recommendations? Yes, I'll, 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 I'll add to what Jayant has said. Uh, without a doubt, uh, the tax saver fund that he has from Canada Rebecca is one of the better funds right now. Um, I think it's a good uh, investment that he has made, but yes, in perspective of what is coming, uh, once the DTC is in place, then um, maybe tax fund might not uh, make sense. Uh, the other fund that he has, the HTC Top 200, is the favorite of the markets, favorite of investors, favorite of analysts and everybody, so without a doubt, that's another good fund. Um, I also notice that he's young, and I think I should congratulate him for starting off. Uh, so early. Uh, for an investor as young as him, uh, you know, he has a, a longer term horizon to look at. And I think uh, being, uh, keeping this in mind, a mid-cap uh, fund will also do good to him. In addition to what Jayanth has recommended, I think uh, the HDFC mid-cap opportunities fund uh, and the IDFC premium equity fund will add more value. Um, younger he is, so he could take a little more risk. Uh, he can make the most of uh, market uh, moving up in, 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 the, in, the, in the medium to the long term. Uh, I believe that uh, he'll do very well if he can add these in addition to uh, Giant's uh, set of funds. Okay, I'm just going to quickly wrap out more details on NHPC before I bring in our next query. Second quarter profit after tax for NHPC at 966 crores compared to 790 crores on a standalone basis. The net sales are at 1830 crores compared to 1431 crores, so a, a gain of almost 400 crores as far as the net sales are concerned for NHPC. Other income has been a substantial booster this time, 18, uh, 181 crores is the other income for NHPC compared to about 170 odd crores on a year to year basis and as I mentioned earlier, what's important is the fact that what's the expansion plan for companies like NHPC uh, and does the street look at that in any uh, uh, enthusiastic fashion because uh, all the projects which they set up, these are long gestation projects, they've talked about scaling up their production but uh, you get a sense that it's going to be some time before you see this incremental capacity coming on board. They've already chalked out a hefty capex plan for investment as far as ramping up production is concerned. Let's come back. We have our next query from Sainath who's written to us. He is investing through an SIP in Reliance Diversified Power Sector Fund, the retail option and he's been doing it for the past four years. Now the question is, should he invest continuously or should he move out specifically because such thematic uh, funds haven't done anything uh, whether it's infra or whether it's power, these funds have been underperforming substantially for the last two, three years, ever since the sector has been underperforming. Uh, Nelson, first to you. I mean, that's a given. Almost everybody's of a consensus view that such thematic ideas generally don't work well, especially when the market's again against them. And particularly for an infra and a power sector fund, the last two, three years have been very turbulent. Do you think he should exit right now and salvage whatever he can? Yes, I think uh, whenever the market should recover, he should exit. But more importantly, I, I'm un unable to understand if this is his core holding. I'm not, to sh I'm not too sure if uh, this is the only holding that he has. But if that is the case, then he'll have to relook at his asset uh, allocation and uh, reallocate uh, money across different funds. Um, I would believe that uh, uh, to be in the sectoral space is high risk. Uh, power sector, for example, hasn't done well uh, in itself. Uh, without a doubt, uh, this will add uh, to our infrastructure story in the future. So if you look at the medium to long term, maybe the power sector should do well. But in terms of the quality of the fund that he owns right now, uh, I would believe uh, there's a lot uh, to be desired. And I believe uh, if he has to exit, 
at a time when the market would recover, even at nominal losses, uh, he should do fine for himself. I would recommend that he starts off, uh, if he's got no other holding, uh, starts off with a large cap fund, maybe the Franklin India Blue Chip Fund or the ICSA Prudential Focus Blue Chip Fund should uh, do well. But um, most essentially, I think um, he should spread his money across various funds to ensure that there is uh, a management of risk uh, in, uh, in terms of his investments. Mm-hmm. Jent, what's your opinion? I mean, do you think he should move out from this thematic fund, maybe get into an HDFC top 200, Franklin Blue Chip, uh, for an investor who hasn't really seen any profits and has to at least get some return back? Do you think uh, these frontline uh, uh, top quartile funds make more sense? Uh, like what Nelson said, it depends on how much he has in the portfolio. If he if there's only one, then I would suggest he sell a part of it at least and move out, but not because I'm taking a view on the fund itself. But simply because from the asset allocation point of view, it's not uh, good to be over concentrated in a thematic fund. So, uh, but other than that, Reliance Diversified Power is one of the better performing sector funds. It's just that the sector is performing poorly, but the fund has outpaced its benchmark across various time frames. So, uh, and plus he has already persevered with it for four years. So, I don't think uh, that he should bail out completely at this point because you never know. See, we don't know when this sector will turn around, but. I think it's it has seen too much of bad news over the last four years. So uh, just looking at the rear view and moving out now. So I mean he may regret that also. So maybe a phased uh, say an, an SWP a, a withdrawal uh, and into some of the other reliance funds if at all. But if this is anyway around 10 to 12 percent of his holding, then I suggest he stay put. Okay, fair enough. Uh, that's how the investor should go about. Uh, managing his portfolio. We'll take a break right now. We come back with Bianca on the news update and of course more questions to answer on the mutual fund space. Welcome back. You're watching BioCell. The rally that we were anticipating has definitely come in but is the rally sustainable? That's a big question and what are global experts making of this move that we have been witnessing at least largely on account of the Eurozone. Shakti joining us as a compilation of what are the prominent market voices and their opinion on this mega rally. Shakti. Ashu, I think uh, the consensus is that uh, none of these uh, market experts believe in this rally is actually sustaining for more than uh, say a couple of days. I have five quotes here. First we have uh, Christopher Woods of uh, CLSA. He says, uh, that uh, they continue to believe that uh, the, the market, the, this global rally in risky assets uh, won't sustain beyond a few days. Uh, uh, what uh, he points out is that uh, the big rally that we have seen over the last few days has lacked volume, so lacked participation. That's one of the major concerns. And secondly, uh, and uh, he points out that uh, every time there's a divergence between the credit markets and the equity markets, credit markets have always won. So they are giving more weightage to the credit mar- markets, and uh, that's why they don't believe that uh, this rally will be durable. Uh, beyond uh, say a few days. The next one Albert uh, Edwards of uh, Society General he says that uh, the increasingly frenzied attempts by Eurozone governments to pursue financial markets that, that they can actually draw a line uh, under this crisis uh, is uh, looking is, will ultimately fail. Uh, this He says that uh, this week's attempts will be short lived and uh, if you believe that uh, the governments in Spain and Italy are bust then the countries like, uh, g- countries like Germany, France even the UK and uh, US are not uh, any better off uh, uh, Edwin Mowat of uh, JPM uh, says that uh, uh, all that this uh, attempt uh, by the Eurozone uh, leaders have done is that they have just delayed the inevitable uh, by a few months. Uh, ultimately, uh, the day of reckoning will come, may not be now, maybe some months down the line. They are saying uh, that the US data is getting slightly better, uh, but uh, and they don't expect the October lows of about 1080 on the S&P 500 to be tested anytime soon. Uh, the only reason it can happen is that uh, if there is a Lehman kind of an event, and that too only if uh, one of the Eurozone members actually go- moves out of the Euro which uh, makes all the contracts they had, uh, uh, that they will ultimately become null and void. Uh, Mark Scofield of Citigroup says that uh, expect a lot of downgrades uh, in the next few months. Uh, uh, Spain first, Portugal, Greece, even France uh, can be downgraded, at least the outlook can be made negative. And uh, again, uh, as I said, uh, unless there is a Lehman kind of an event, uh, even uh, US uh, might actually be downgraded uh, going forward. 
many associates, uh, they mostly look at technicals uh, at yesterday's highs, say around 1290 on the S&P 500. They are saying that uh, the market is as overbought as it has uh, ever been in the last uh, uh, 12 to 15 months. And at 1291, that was at yesterday's when they put out this note, they were saying that uh, their sector timing model indicates that the market has reached its absolute sell price. So it's beyond that, uh, they don't see the market uh, rallying any further. So these are the codes. Uh, as I said, uh, the ultimate theme or the bottom line of uh, all these codes, the market experts believe that uh, uh, this rally, we have seen this frenzied rally we have seen over the last few days in currencies, commodities, equities. Uh, none of them are buying this, uh, that this will actually last for more than a couple of days. Hmm. Shakti, thanks for that. Uh, so voices of uh, skepticism are, are still out there even though we have seen some closure as far as the Eurozone deal is concerned. Uh, Jindal Pauli, that's the stock I'm going to talk about. Uh, buyback has been announced. The company plans to buy back shares up to 140 crore rupees at a price of up to 350 rupee per share. That's a hefty upside from where the stock is right now. 235, 236 is where the stock is. The buyback price is at 350 rupee per share. You, could, you would see some bit of uh, move up. Uh, the stock's already up 11%. Uh, we'll touch base with the management uh, to find out how much would they be buyback as far as Jindal Pauli is concerned and post that, what will be the promoter's take look like as far as the company is concerned. Let's come back. We have uh, our next query, which is an email from Sayyid Rehan, who's uh, holding pretty interesting uh, investments in mutual fund space. HDFC tax saver, the growth option through a lump sum basis, ICIC prudential tax plan, Birla Sun Life tax relief, fidelity tax advantage, reliance infra uh, through the, uh, through, that's also a lump sum. None of his investments are through the SIP route. They're all through the lump sum uh, route uh, Nelson, first to you. Uh, I see good names, but I see some of the ones which haven't really done anything. Uh, do you think it's a, a major reshuffle is, re is required as far as Sayyid Rehan is concerned with his portfolio? Um, I think uh, in terms of his investment appetite, investment style, it looks like he tends to invest when there is a tax break coming up in a year. Clearly, he has invested uh, only in uh, tax funds except for one. Uh, fund which is the Reliance Infra Fund. Um, uh, uh, when I look at it, I think there is very little scope for him to um, uh, reshuffle and move out because tax funds have a three-year uh, uh, lock-in. Um, I think uh, he should also try and look at uh, non-tax fund. I mean, uh, he could necessarily look at l large caps, multi caps, mid caps. Again, uh, I really cannot comment uh, a lot here because I have no idea how old is he at the moment. Um, but I think um, when I look at the funds, uh, there is very little scope for him to do much because they are in the tax space. Uh, with, the with, with the Reliance Infra, I think uh, he can possibly switch to a ICIC Prudential Infra Fund because uh, the infrastructure ICIC Fund is a better fund than uh, the Reliance Infrastructure Fund. Uh, that is at least what we believe at Fund Supermarket. Um, I think um, as long as he can uh, get the right timing and move on, uh, to this fund, he should do fine on that front. But by and large, I think as an investor, he should uh, he should look at mutual funds a little more seriously beyond uh, tax funds alone. Tax funds uh, have a three-year lock-in, and uh, they they really don't give you uh, the flavors that you might uh, get in other uh, categories of funds, such as the large cap, mid caps, and the multi caps. Uh, that's my point of view. Okay, uh, Jent, what's your point of view? Yeah, I only hope he has not invested in all these at the same time. Because he, while it is a lump sum, if we add up all this, it goes beyond 1 lakh, which anyway is beyond the ATC limit. So anyway, uh, it's not good to invest in lump sum, so the SIP approach is much better. Now, he has to stay put till the lock-in is over. Once it is over, then I suggest that he switch to other non-ELSS funds within the same fund house, because the fund houses are good. So for instance, uh, HDFC tax saver, he could move to HDFC equity. ICICI tax plan he could move to ICICI Focus Blue Chip, which is a large cap fund. Uh, Birla Sun Life uh, tax uh, advantage he could move to uh, Birla Mid Cap and Fidelity tax he could move to Fidelity Equity Fund. So that way he will have uh, one large cap, couple of large to mid cap funds and one mid cap fund. Now Reliance Infra actually is a relatively new fund and uh, it has certainly fallen a lot in the last one year. It has uh, fallen around 40%. So, in comparison to ICICI Infra and Tata Infra, two of the uh, uh, so-called poster boys of the infra sector, it has certainly fallen more. But I think that this is partly because it has remained true to label. Unlike the other two funds, both ICICI and Tata, they have moved uh, heavily into financials, which is really not an infra sector, uh, part of the infra sector. So, reliance has remained true and so that's why it has suffered. So, going ahead, I feel that uh, we should give some benefit of doubt to the fund manager and monitor the performance for the next at least 6 to 8 months 
and see how it has done because it has performed better than its own benchmark. So that way we have to give it some benefit of doubt. Uh, so it doesn't, I feel that you should stay put and see once the infra sector actually revives, then maybe this one will outperform the others. Okay, let's uh, step back, uh, talk about the equity markets again. Uh, Enam's Manish Shokhani believes that it's a very good time to build a portfolio uh, based on long-term investment calls. Let's quickly hear out uh, where would he put his money in in this kind of a market. The macro often obscures underlying reality of companies. Uh, again, small examples I've been using that if in the year 2000 you had just stepped back and looked at the home mortgage business in India, it was a $9 billion market in aggregate. And if anyone would have told you the Indian mortgage market can be bought for $9 billion, you could have put 100% of your money there and I kick myself for not being so smart to have done it then. But even today, remember the number I gave you for uh, real estate in India is at least worth $5 trillion at asset value. The mortgage business in India even today is worth only $100 billion. That explains why HDFC Limited compounded the way it did over the entire decade of the 2000s. But even if you take this number of 100 today, where do you think it will be 10 years out? Will it be 700 billion? If it is 7x uh, in the next 10 years, you know people have you know enough savings in India to first of all aspire to buy a larger house and be to afford to pay their EMIs even if they stretch upwards or downwards. It's no way linked to the subprime crisis of the rest of the world or the excess inventory which is you know sitting unsold in China. It may still be a fantastic place to be. Another example, take your own business. For the last, what, 20 years, we've been used to a mom and pop cable wala giving us a cable connection in our home. And we are spoiled, we pay 110 or 150 rupees a month for it. Over time, over the last four or five years, five or six DTH companies have emerged. The 35 million homes already connected to DTH and the cable is slowly getting sidelined. We're getting used to watching HDTV, at least for cricket matches, if nothing else. At 36 million, I can afford to release a movie into the DTA channel and make more out of that channel rather than through theoretical release. If we say we are a largely con domestic consumption economy, 60% of consumption should be capturing our domestic consumption on the GDP. So if we are a trillion and a half of GDP, there is a trillion of consumption. Let's say 60% of that consumption has to be sold at the retail level, whether it's food, shampoos, garments, whatever. To me, it looks like we are a $600 billion retail opportunity. The total organized retail, when I look at it in India today, using the same example of mortgages, the number for organized retail in India is something like $25 billion. The current market is 600. And if the GDP triples in the next 10 years, this is going to be a $2 trillion market. Your starting base is $25 billion. What's the potential that can happen over here? It doesn't matter whether you buy company A, B or C. The same way it didn't matter honestly if you bought HDFC, LIC housing or Groove Finance or whatever it was. You made a lot more of course in uh, HDFC but you also did reasonably well in the others. The same thing may happen here as well. If all this power shortage actually which we are seeing even in Bombay now materializes, power tariffs are bound to go up in India. You've seen today a headline about states having to write off 100,000 crores of subsidized power. Power tariffs are headed up. What do you think will happen to coal prices which Coal India today sells at 60% below international prices? And as the largest coal company in the world, look out four years from now, we are an energy short company. Looking at the very short term that oh my god this is you know going to get hurt in the short run, may make you mix the entire ride which occurs over the next five years. Well, those are ample amount of stock ideas which Manish actually talked about uh, in ranging from the consumer space to the likes of Coal India capitalizing on the power uh, story here in the country. We'll take a break right now. We come back and we'll get a preview going on what to expect as far as Maruti's second quarter numbers are concerned. Welcome back. You're watching by yourself. Let's talk about Maruti. Second quarter numbers are anticipated. Pankaj is joining us with the key highlights of what to expect as far as Maruti is concerned. Pankaj. 
Well, if you really look at the Marathi numbers, will be highly impacted by the Manasar strike that they had in the last quarter, uh, and that's why you know volumes which we already have are down about 20% uh, on a year-on-year -year basis, and the sales uh, would also be declining by close to about 19 to 20% as far as street estimates are concerned. Profit I expected to decline slightly more uh, than sales in terms of percentage terms, but margins is something to watch out for. About 8.2, 8.3 is the street estimate. Both decline on a YOY and on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, largely because the company has uh, you know facing these Manasar plants that other expenditure would actually increase quite tremendously and secondly uh, the raw material prices have been on a high so that will impact uh, their numbers as far as realization is concerned largely expect realization to be flat with a, with a positive bias on uh, uh, slightly 1 to 2 percent increase on a quarter on quarter basis largely because of more diesel cars being sold uh, so that is one thing that will impact the realizations quite positively but going ahead management commentary on what will be the sort of production that they do in the entire year uh, is something that everybody would be watching out for uh, and you know uh, when Manasar uh, operations will get back to uh, exact normal and uh, you know even the other plants what is the sort of production and what are their plans how much will they do for the entire year is something to focus on once results are out mm, Pankaj thanks for that we'll come back to you once the numbers for Maruti come out uh, the stocks not looking good right now uh, Nigerian regulator apparently has warned Bharti Airtel and even its competitor MTN on poor service quality that's the report we're getting it right now from one of the prominent wire services uh, also, the telecom regulator in Nigeria has actually threatened to fine the Indian subsidiary Airtel Nigeria and two other companies if they fail to improve the quality of their mobile services and prevent them from registering new subscribers. The stock's reacting to that. It's down one-third of a percent right now as far as Bharti is concerned. So, uh, issue of quality cropping up for Bharti. But you get a sense that the whole Africa story for Bharti is going to take some time to uh, to come back and start to contribute meaningfully at least to the numbers as far as Bharti is concerned. The numbers are still not out. I believe in the first week of November, that's when we see the numbers for Bharti Atel coming out and could shed some light on what's the progress as far as Africa ramp up is concerned. Let's move on. We have our next query uh, from Guru Raj, who's joining us right now from Bangalore. Guru Raj, hi, what's your question? Okay, we lost him, but uh, Guru Raj is aged 27. And he's a banker. Uh, Guraj has uh, Axis Tax Saver. Uh, that's the investment that he has right now. And uh, he wants to know what he should do. Uh, should he continue or not? Uh, Nelson, first to you. Axis Tax Saver, what's your opinion? Um, I would actually prefer another fund instead of the Axis Tax Saver fund. Uh, but another point that I'd like to mention, since I've seen that question before, uh, he says. Uh, 80,000 lump sum investment is what has been made. Um, I would believe that the SIP route is the best route uh, for an investor who gets into mutual funds. Um, I think uh, lump sum investments, you know, uh, tend to have the element of risk because you can never time the markets. Um, I think that is one thing that he should always keep in mind when it comes to lump sum investment. He should p possibly look at a uh, transfer plan if he has a lump sum so that, you know, over a period of time the money is transferred uh, into a, a fund uh, bit by bit. Uh, with regard to the fund, coming back to it, I think uh, I think uh, he should look at an exit once he's finished the three-year time frame. And uh, I would have actually preferred the HDFC tax fund instead of the Access Tax Saver fund. Uh, because I believe uh, the HDFC fund has done uh, far better. Uh, the other thing is he's only 27 years of age. Um, like I told uh, the earlier uh, caller, uh, it would obviously make more sense for investors to look at mutual funds beyond uh, investments at the time of uh, tax breaks. Uh, they should look at mutual funds uh, for serious investing. They should look at non-tax funds uh, in the multi-cap, mid-cap, large-cap space too. Um, for Guru Raj, I think uh, he has a lot of time and on his hand. He's only 27, so it's a good time for him to get started now and uh, look at the mu larger mutual fund universe and see what he can look at. There are a lot of funds that we've been advising on this show. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of advice available even on the internet. So he can look for it and uh, start investing seriously uh, beyond the tax favor bit. Right, Jayant, what's your opinion? Yeah, actually, <coughs> Axis uh, Tax Saver is not amongst my favorite ones, but uh, surprisingly, they have done pretty well since inception. In fact, Value Research has ranked them number one over, on a one-year period amongst 37 funds, amongst the ELSS category. But I feel that one, the portfolio churn is too high in this fund, and uh, secondly, even the pedigree. I mean, uh, it has yet to prove itself over a longer term. Now, anyway, he is locked in for three years, so. He can monitor the performance and after that, he, uh, unfortunately, Axis does not have any other decent funds where he can switch to. 
So after that, I suggest she switch to either say an HDFC equity or a Franklin Blue Chip or any of the other established funds, and uh, you know quit this scheme. Okay. Well, Sapna has written to us from Mumbai. She wants to invest fifty thousand. Wants our suggestion on the best mutual funds. Wants to go through the SIP route. And uh, Nelson, uh, I think the entire market wants to know which are the best funds out there which can be uh, looked at, and that too from an SIP route. Let's get your perspective. Right. Uh, first of all, Sapna is doing the right thing by getting into the SIP route. Uh, without a doubt, in these uh, market conditions. SIP will make good sense. Uh, there's too much of volatility. It's very difficult to time the market. Very difficult to even look at the medium term at the moment. I mean, a lot of people would have said medium to long term is so much easier to look at uh, uh, a few months ago. But today, it's even difficult to look at the medium term. Uh, things are going so wrong all over the place. Um, uh, I would actually recommend uh, the SIP route to anyone. I have done a, uh, a breakup for Sapna, uh, and I'd like to uh, bring that breakup uh, out to you. I believe 30% of a portfolio should go into the large cap space. Uh, the ICC Focus Blue Chip Fund is a good fund if she is interested in the large cap uh, mutual fund space. I believe 20% of our portfolio should go into the IDFC Premier Fund, uh, Kenneth Andrade's fund, one of the best funds that I, I have seen in recent times. Uh, Mid-caps at the moment aren't, do, aren't doing too well, but uh, these are times when you should get into funds like these and make the most, because when the markets recover, you will do extremely well for yourself. Another 30% could go into the Fidelity Equity Fund, a fund which has been around for about uh, some time now. Uh, when it started, it wasn't a great fund for a lot of people. But if you really look at it over the last three years, uh, over the last five years, you'll find that this has been one of the best funds uh, for someone to stay invested in the multi-cap space. Um, I believe 20% uh, of our portfolio should be with the HTFC balanced fund. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, amongst the balanced fund lot, this is the best fund. Uh, without a doubt, HTFC has been uh, the topmost fund house for for, for, for investors and uh, if HTFC didn't have a fund in the uh, balance fund space it will be uh, surprising. So we have got HTFC balance fund which I would recommend uh, uh, in, in this particular space. Right. Mm, that's a pretty comprehensive analysis there. Jayant, what's hot on, on your radar? What would you endorse for the investor? Yeah, actually I got a, a simpler prescription. Uh, first is if she's a beginner, first uh, she has to get her uh, KYC number from, uh, I mean without that she can, cannot invest. So. You could uh, download this form from campsonline.com and uh, then uh, fill it up and submit it to camps and then uh, get your KYC number and then your KYC and PAN will be enough for you to uh, you know, get the formalities done. After that, uh, okay now regarding this 50,000, uh, since she wants to do it in, uh, in the SIP form, uh, she could take 48,000 and divide that into 12 equal installments, that is 4,000 each. Balance 2000 could be put in some short term debt fund like a Kotak floater or BNP Money Plus. Now this 4000 per month you could divide it further into two equal installments of 2000 each. One part could go into a pure large cap fund, say an ICICI focused blue chip or a Franklin blue chip. The other part could go into a pure mid cap fund like uh, say IDFC Premier Equity or an HDFC mid cap. So you keep investing in this way for, uh, for one year and then you review your portfolio. Hmm. Okay. All right, that's a fair call, a fair bit of assessment there from both our experts. Gentlemen, it's always a pleasure having you with us. Uh, Nelson, it's a first uh, for you with us, so Thank great you. having you with us. And uh, Jen, this is always be, uh, of course, uh, Thanks, wonderful Thanks, talking Ash. to you as well on the mutual fund space. So with that, we wrap up this edition of BioCell. But stay with us, uh, Power Lunch is up next.